Great. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here for this month's Science Matters. We are uh, excited to have John Ray here from our neighborly institution just down the way. Uh, John is an assistant member at the Benaroya Research Institute. Um, I don't know if he's a native of Seattle, but did his undergrad here at UW. And was a technician in Lali Ramakrishnan's lab for a while, where I think the immunology bug was seeded deep into his soul. Uh, he went and did graduate work at Yale. And then in his postdoc work at the Broad, he really began to become interested in using technologies, especially high throughput technologies, to try to dissect some of the many, many, many variants that we tend to see in genome-wide association studies in terms of what they might actually be doing in the context of cell-based systems. So his lab right now has some amazing technologies and a diverse variety of uh, immune and autoimmune related pathologies and diseases, where he uses these awesome, cool technologies to figure out ways that mechanistically these GWAS, GWAS variants might be doing important things in, uh, in diseases. So we're excited to have John. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for that introduction, Rick. Um, should we do the light search for, excuse me, uh, yeah, uh, thank you for that introduction. I've been, uh, I, I am traditionally an immunologist, but I have been sort of switching into a, uh, a functional genomics, um, person for the past seven years. And I have this sort of cryptic title of you can't see the trees for the forest, kind of a play on can't see the forest for the trees. Uh, because autoimmunity is really this complex uh, uh, thing where the disease is is present and you can tell the individual has it, but what are the what are the causal roots? And so uh, that's something that my lab is really uh, interested in finding out. So uh, the major players for for this talk are uh, Alex Hoke, who's a postdoc in my lab, and also Max Dippel, who is a technician who did a lot of the analysis for this um, for this project. Uh, and, and for today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, some previous published work, but then also what we've done recently to, to sort of extend that um, to primary T cells. So um, as, as many of you know, autoimmune diseases are highly heritable. Uh, and we know that from monozygotic twin studies where uh, one twin can get disease early in life, but the next twin has up to 65% chance of getting disease uh, in their lifetime. And so this suggests that there's a high uh, genetic concordance between twins. And if you were to look at diazygotic twins, they'd be down here at 20%. So there really is a, a genetic concordance um, between twins. And so that suggests that there are regions of the genome that contribute to the uh, disease. And to get at those for the past 20 years, um, uh, scientists have been looking at uh, large numbers of cases and controls to look at genetic variants throughout the genome that, um, that associate with disease. And so uh, we can look at uh, one of the 9 million uh, genetic variants throughout the genome to see whether it's preferentially in cases versus controls. And we can map them in these Manhattan plots where negative log p-value is uh, the association p-value. And uh, uh, on the x-axis here, we have chromosomes, and each dot represents a genetic variant. So if it's above this dotted line here, it's genome-wide significant, suggesting that that region of the genome is super important for driving disease. If we zoom in on this region, though, uh, you can see that many genetic variants uh, are associated with disease in this, in this one region. One might assume that all of these individually can be contributing to disease, but actually um, uh, there's this R-squared matrix, which is linkage disequilibrium, and so that's, uh, uh, this variant is very uh, concordant with this variant. So they tend to be uh, inherited together. And so they're very, they're very correlated. So the more parsimonious explanation is that actually only one or a small number of these variants are actually driving disease. And most of them are actually outside of genes. And so we don't actually know which gene is, is the causal gene. And we don't really know the mechanism for how these, how these uh, variants drive disease. Uh, so uh, I was giving the R squared uh, example in that last slide. So, so this is just depicting how linkage disequilibrium works. There's recombination hotspots throughout the genome uh, in a given population, and then uh, SNPs are inherited in blocks. So if you have this one causal variant on this block, there may be other variants that are sort of confounding our ability to understand the mechanisms that drive disease. 
So uh, what my lab is really focused on is really understanding which variants are actually causing disease on each disease haplotype, uh, what cell types they, they have that effect on, what, what uh, effects on gene expression they have, uh, and eventually how uh, that alters cellular physiology and, and um, the ph physiology of the organism to, to lead to disease. And uh, to sort of get at this, uh, we've been more focused on variants that are outside of genes because 90% of autoimmune disease associated variants are actually outside of genes in non-coding regions. And uh, there they're enriched in enhancer regions. So regions of, uh, uh, of the genome that are outside of genes that can actually loop to promoters of genes and facilitate their gene expression. And uh, the way that we can identify those is by using methods like DNA one hypersensitivity, which uh, preferentially cleaves uh, chromatin uh, that's nucleosome free. So normally your genome is very tightly wound around nucleosomes, uh, but certain regions are actually more accessible and that's where proteins can come and bind and actually facilitate an enhancer promoter interaction. And uh, this is a very cell type specific phenomenon. And so um, here we've mapped all of the DNA one hypersensitivity uh, sensitive regions uh, for many different cell types from ENCODE. And then we looked at genetic variants for all these different diseases. And we just looked for whether they were enriched in a specific cell types um, regions of accessible chromatin. We find that T cells are actually quite enriched for genetic variants uh, for various autoimmune diseases. So that's why we use uh, T cells or what that, why we study T cells. Uh, so for us to be able to understand how variants uh, affect gene expression or enhancer activity, uh, we can use assays such as a traditional luciferase assay where we can clone in a segment of the genome centered on the variant, uh, the reference or the alternate allele of that variant, uh, and then test both alleles in a luciferase assay where there's a minimal promoter and then the luciferase uh, reporter construct can transfect cells with this plasmid construct and then see whether there's differences in luminescence between the reference and alternate allele. Uh, we since used a much more updated version of this assay that can test tens of thousands of variants at the same time. Uh, instead of using luminescence as the readout, we use uh, DNA barcodes that are actually at the three prime end of the reporter and used RNA sequencing of the reporter to basically assess uh, the levels of expression from the reference and alternate allele. So then we can pick up highly significant uh, differences between uh, our, uh, variants that drive allele specific differences in expression. And we did this for 20,000 variants associated with uh, multiple sclerosis, type 1 diabetes, inflammatory bowel disease, RA, and psoriasis. Uh, just to give you a sense for what the data look like, so some of the, uh, the elements that we put into this assay will have activity over baseline. So uh, that's uh, depicted here with the uh, elements in blue. So that just means that there's more RNA expression of that particular element than you would expect from, what, uh, from its prevalence in the plasmid library. And we have a set of positive and negative controls. Uh, so the positive controls we expected to express more, and here they are in blue, and negative controls that don't have any activity. So they, they shouldn't uh, drive any activity in the assay. And then our library is in, in uh, green. And then uh, we look for allele-specific effects on gene expression. So that those are depicted here in purple, and we call those expression modulating variants or MVARs. So variants that drive an allele-specific effect on expression uh, should have um, allelic skew in one direction or the other. So uh, these expression modulating variants are, are what we think are the causal variants because they actually cause a difference in, in enhancer activity. Uh, we see that around a third of loci have an expression modulating variant, and the rest of these could actually be accounted for by coding variants, by splicing variants, by uh, a variant that acts in a different cell type. Uh, so we, we still have you know, a bunch of other variants to find, but um, we, the, the assay generally does find one variant per locus. So that sort of gets, gets us at our uh, more parsimonious explanation of uh, one variant really driving disease.
the assay really actually quite effectively reads out transcription factor binding. So if a variant, a given variant is predicted to disrupt uh, transcription factor binding, the effect on expression uh, is quite concordant. And, um, and it, I should say that the MVARs are actually enriched for overlapping transcription factor motifs. So it's, it's likely that the assay is reading out transcription factor binding. Uh, so how do we know that the assay is actually finding disease causal variants? So we can take some other data that actually can statistically predict whether a given variant is likely causal. So the, the, we, can, we call that genetic fine mapping. So that just allows us to assign probabilities to each variant inside of the locus uh, for causing disease. And we can see whether the highly probable variants are actually our MVARs. So um, here I'm gonna just show you some uh, enrichment bar plots, but uh, what you need to know are the variants that are on the right side are the likely causal variants. So with a uh, high probability, 50% or above of causing disease, whereas these are basically all of the variants. So as we more stringently uh, um, look at the most likely causal variants, uh, we see that they're enriched in DNAs one hypersensitivity sites, which we expect. That, so that just means that they're more likely to be in enhancers. Uh, when we look at our MVARs, we actually see that we, we highly enrich for, for likely causal variants up to 30-fold. And then if we look at MVARs in accessible chromatin, we enrich upwards of 60-fold. So we believe that the assay is actually identifying uh, disease causal variants. Oh, and I should say, uh, if you have any questions, just feel free to like raise your hand and interrupt me. I like I like a, like an interactive... Okay. Uh, how is the probability of disease causing? What's that based on? The probability. Uh, so this is so it's it's an analysis called PICS that assigns probability uh, according to R squared and um, and p value. So it's not the best type of uh, fine map genetic fine mapping that you can do, but it allows us to test many different diseases at the same time. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the uh, PVA. Uh, the the GWAS. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, so you know, if there's a coding variant mm -hmm. next to the, the right. Really yeah. So if the if the GWAS p value for that particular variant is higher than the other variants in the locus, then it's more likely to be deemed the highest probability, according to this analysis. Uh, so there's more complex Bayesian statistical analyses that actually do better at assigning probabilities, but um, we didn't have that in our toolbox uh, because we don't have raw genotypes for most of these GWASs. So like the problem with GWAS is a lot of it's behind a locked. You can't get access to raw genotypes. Where, where you can actually do a bunch of these um, statistical analyses to better predict causal variants. Yep. Did I see another one? Does your reward assay distinguish between repressors versus activators? That's a great question. Okay. Uh, oh, and for anyone who, can I hear the question usually? Okay. It's very oh, okay. Um, so, uh, the first question was on what were the probabilities coming from for this PICS analysis, and my answers were uh, uh, based on linkage to equilibrium and p-value from the GWAS uh, for this particular analysis, but there's better ways of doing it. Uh, and then the second question is, is the assay good at look, finding repressors? Uh, so from this plot, you can see that most of the elements that we're feeding into the assay are actually more active. Uh, but later, I'm going to show you some primary T cell data that actually allows us to pick up some repressors. But, oh, go ahead. The design from the beginning is like uh, you, you feed it with the one that are actually uh, promoting it instead of. Uh, so we don't do any sort of binning based on. Uh, whether it's binding a transcription factor or anything like that. We just look at all the variants, even if they're coding, 
and like see whether they have an effect on gene expression in the assay. Sure. Good questions. Okay, so uh, we believe that the assay is actually doing a really good job at finding likely causal variants. Even if this isn't the best fine mapping analysis, we're still identifying likely causal variants from PICs. The, the caveat being that most, uh, most loci actually don't have a likely causal variant. So we're, we're probably doing better than we even think we are from, from this specific analysis. Uh, okay, so here's just plotting 60 variants that are MVARs that are also inaccessible chromatin in T cells according to DNA cyprosensitivity sites. And this is just uh, ordered according to their uh, allelic uh, skew, so allelic bias and in, in expression. And I just want to bring your attention to um, all, all of the genes down here, are either nearby genes or, or EQTLs, which means that that variant is uh, associated with differences in the expression of that gene. Uh, so I'll just point you to this variant here, uh, which is in the BOC2 locus and associated with BOC2 gene expression in T cells. So this variant is very specifically in CD4 and CD8 T cell accessible chromatin and not in D cells or monocytes. It overlaps in ETS1 uh, chip seek binding, and it's predicted to, to disrupt ETS1 uh, binding according to motif analysis. Uh, when we looked at heterozygous donors and just did a chromatin accessibility assay called a TAP seek, uh, we see that chromatin accessibility is very regulated uh, by this variant. So in the, in the non-risk context, there's lots of chromatin accessibility. And the context of the risk variant, there's very little chromatin accessibility. And others have done super shift assays with EMSA and found that ETS1 really is disrupted by this variant. Uh, this variant is also uh, associated, like I said before, with BOC2 expression, with the, the non-risk allele driving having more expression and the risk allele having less expression. And that's very specific to naive T cells. So that's even in, in naive T cells that have recently been activated, it's not, it's not um, significant. So it's, it's resting naive T cells. And only in naive T cells do we see an interaction with that variant with the promoter using promoter capture IC, which is a method for uh, you to be able to look at regions of the genome that interact with promoters physically. And in a more recent study, uh, that uh, interaction is very allele specific for this particular variant. So like in the context of the risk allele, there is no interaction between the variant and the promoter of this gene. So it very much is looking like this variant is, is regulating this gene. But the best possible experiment you could do is by just uh, editing the genome uh, and seeing if there's an effect on expression. So, here we have the non-risk allele, here we have the risk allele, and we're trying to edit the non-risk non allele into the risk allele. To do that, we use a base editor, which can edit this, uh, this C into a, a U, and then polymerase reads it as a T. So you're converting uh, this G to an A in effect. And so uh, we did that in JERCAT T cells, and we actually found that it is associated with a significant reduction in BOC2 expression. So we've sort of closed the loop on uh, understanding whether this variant is actually causally affecting BOC2 expression. And uh, it's also conserved between mouse and human. So we decided to make a mouse where the variant had a small dilution surrounding the variant. And, and that also encapsulated this um, X binding motif. In those mice, we took the CD8 T cells and uh, the naive CD8 T cells and co-transferred the mutant cells with the wild type cells into mice. And then we infected them with a virus that the T cells were specific to. So um, this is crossed to a T cell transgenic, which allows uh, those T cells to be very specific to this OVA peptide. So this uh, infection of this virus into mice allows these T cells to expand preferentially and differentiate. And what we saw was that actually in the context of that, of the, the deletion, 
that they are much more likely to become effector CDA T cells and much less likely to become memory T cells. And so uh, that really falls in line with what we know BOC2 does in T cells because it's a negative regulator of effector T cell differentiation. And so that suggests that this, this variant in this uh, cis regulatory region actually has a plays a big role in whether that, that T cell is going to become an effector T cell, which could be why these, these, um, uh, this variant is really important for autoimmune disease. Uh, we've also um, sort of uh, done a much more expensive way of, of looking at this, where we took those cells and did single cell RNA sequencing, and uh, we mapped out these clusters where the, this is a terminal effector cluster, this is a central memory cluster, and we actually see that the BOC2 cells tend to cluster much more in the terminal effector than, than in the central memory. So in effect, uh, through using MQRA and through using uh, these sort of downstream functional readouts, we're able to nail down uh, likely causal variants and their effects in, in T cells. So this was all um, published work, and this would probably be a good time for any more questions. Um, because uh, I'm about to transition to not published work. We talked about the uh, is, it, is there a specific disease that this is called? Oh, or yes. What is the yeah. effect size of the, yeah. like the individual? Polymorphism? Great question. Yeah, so actually, by and large, unless it's in the HLA locus, uh, the effect sizes tend not to be more than 1.8 uh, odds ratio. Um, and uh, for this particular variant, it's associated with many diseases like type 1 diabetes, IBD, um, rheumatoid arthritis, and a bunch of other things like uh, mosquito bite size, like other things that I guess T cells are involved with that I had no idea. But um, it's, it's pretty interesting that, it, that it's associated with so many different diseases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, I don't think that there, well, there's probably rare variation in BOC2. I haven't looked at that. That's a good question. But I'm sure that um, obviously the effects would be much larger on, on T cell function. Yeah. So for the causal variants, do you see any overlap with the repetitive sequences in the genome? I guess also the other associated question is do the alleles itself, are they 100% present in the genome or they are? Just uh, the MMI has a good variable in set of MMI presents. Um, so the GWAS, so like, I, are you saying that do the do the patients always have the allele? Yeah. No. Okay. Yeah. That's good. That's a good good answer that I want yes. to know. So the other one is, do you see any overlap between these highly highly causal uh, variables? and repetitive sequences? I'm sure that's there. I just I I don't know. Yeah. Chances are they are, I think. <laughs> I mean, I think some of them possibly, uh, but not the ones that I'm studying, probably. Yeah. Maybe maybe some, but not all, not many. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yes. How does this bias and differentiation pathway contribute to the genetic type? Yeah. So we've, that's really hard to nail down because the effect size is so small. Um, but uh, we have seen, that there is a slight increase in severity in a EAE model, which is a model of multiple sclerosis. So if we make this deletion inside of a T cell that's specific to your myelin, then those mice actually get more severe paralysis than, than uh, wild type mice. But uh, that's been really, like it's super variable uh, and uh, we're still trying to tease that apart. Great. Okay. So um, I, I may have forgotten to say that we did the MPRA in JERCAT T cells. Was it just cell line? And uh, we did our base editing in the JERCAT T cells as well. And JERCATs are great as a model of T cells, but they are not T cells. They are immortalized in cell culture. They are cancer uh, cells. Uh, they have chronic signaling that is not from their T cell receptor. So they're very different than T cells. 
they are unable to, to be differentiated or recapitulate specific fates of T cells. So T cells, uh, for those who aren't familiar, are um, essentially the cells that can basically recognize most any foreign particles that can enter your body and, and attack it. So, uh, and they, to do that, they need to basically be differentiated into different types of T cells. So like there's T cells that are specific to your guts that may be uh, regulating your gut responses with microbiota. There's T cells that get rid of uh, worms from your digestive tract. There's T cells that fight viruses. And so jerk cats can't adequately recapitulate all of those different properties of T cells. And um, it's a huge challenge to do this in primary T cells because the methods just haven't been worked out and you need to get fresh blood and, you know, it's just, jerk cats are way easier to deal with in culture, for sure. So we recently did MPRAs in primary T cells because an uh, amazing postdoc in the lab, Alex, uh, has sort of worked out all the methodologies for, for, for doing that approach. And here you're starting to get some repressors uh, from that question earlier. So uh, it is pretty interesting. So like, would we find more repressors if we used a different type of assay? So like I said before, we were using a minimal promoter. And if we used a more active promoter, would we find more regions that actually shut down active gene expression in that assay? So that could be a way that we actually okay. find. No, no, I didn't know it I think someone uh, needs to be... Okay, sounds good. <laughs> um, so similar to our, our jerk hat MPRAs, we see uh, our positive controls light up in our primary human T cell MPRAs and negative controls more or less stay uh, near zero. And um, we had to essentially do some grid searches to figure out the best cutoffs for primary T cells, but um, we found uh, here are expression modulating variants and, um, and there are putative cis regulatory elements that don't have allele specific activity. Uh, one really nice thing uh, that we started implementing is just seeing whether the active elements in the MPRA are actually finding uh, T cell specific uh, enhancers. And so to, to answer that question, we took ENCODE data, uh, which has all the DNA hypersensitivity profiles for like hundreds of cell types. And we looked to see uh, where our active elements were enriched most. So we actually find the T cell uh, DNA hypersensitivity regions are, are most enriched for active elements. In our and again, we find around a third of the, the loci have an M bar. And uh, we also see that there is a very strong enrichment for, for likely causal variants, uh, just like we found for primary T cells so, or for JERCAT. So we're finding very similar data that we found to JERCAT is the same thing as JERCAT. So here I'm plotting uh, the allele specific expression in primary T cells in red and the JERCAT in blue. So the answer, the short answer is no. Um, some of the variants are the same, uh, and more or less the directionality and expression is the same, but many of the variants have no activity in jerk hat, but they do have activity in primary T cells and vice versa. Uh, and so we don't get a huge overlap between the M bars that we discover in the primary T cells versus the jerk hats. And uh, so to really understand why this was the case, it's possible, like given that MPRA reads out uh, transcription factor binding, potentially, we did a transcription factor motif analysis to see whether trans specific transcription factors were, were driving this effect. So in primary T cells, we, in the context of the transcription factor binding more tightly to the variant, uh, we see an increase in expression in the context of inflammatory TFs like MF kappa B, STATs, IRFs and a reduction in expression in the context of repressors like GFI-1B. However, in the context of jerk cats, we actually see a strong preference for ETS factors. And if we do a direct comparison between the two, we actually see that the X, fa X factors are actually shared between primary T cells and jerk cats um, 
here, let me walk you through this. So, th so this is a little bit difficult to explain, but uh, the size of the dot is uh, significant in primary T cells, and then the opacity is significant in JOPA. So here we have a large dot that's um, very solid, and so that means it's very significant in both primary T cells and in JOPAs. Whereas a large dot that's that's more translucent is more is is a, a, a variant that or a TF that acts in primary T cells and not in JOPAs. So you can see these inflammatory TFs are more enriched in the primary T cells, whereas they just share all of these X factors in ATF one. So we just find this really interesting because uh, sure cats are very much used as a model of T cells, but they don't really reflect accurately the, the sort of transcription factor usage that um, you would want to see <laughs> because NF kappa B plays a very large role in T cell biology. So to not be able to see that in sure cat is a big deal. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so uh, maybe you said it at the very beginning, but are are you for fusing your reporter construct? Are you taking like a five kb piece? Oh, okay. Yes, I didn't say that. Thank you for asking. Uh, so the question was about how big the um, area around the variant that we're cloning into the reporter assay. It's only two hundred bases, so it's really small. Yeah. So. But it's centered on the variant. So the, any any TF binding site that it potentially disrupts should be within that 200 base pairs. So within 200 base pairs, you don't have binding, you have binding sites for all of these, or these are just effects? We're only plotting binding. binding. So this is all based on transcription factor binding disruption by a variant. So like the, vent, the variant is in the center, does it disrupt the TF, yes or no? And, how to, and does it also drive an increase or decrease in expression? So like in the context of this, uh, many variants that we tested in primary T cells that had an effect uh, had, were disrupting NF kappa B and those variants tended to drive more expression. So when you disrupt NF kappa B, you, re you reduce expression, but when you bind NF kappa B more tightly, you drive expression. Sorry, I said this before, but so you're evaluating NF-kappa-B by the pull down or by... Oh. This is all in silico uh, motif prediction and whether the variant is predicted to disrupt that motif. We don't have any experimental data to, to know that yet. That's a good question. Oh, sorry. Uh, the question was, um, is it known that these TFs actually bind in the context of the assay? And the answer is no. Uh, the, the only thing that this assay takes into account is whether a specific motif is disrupted by a genetic variant. How different is the transcriptional profile of the primary T cell and the whole T cell population? I guess that's two different the, the, I, you know, if I understand, but there's primary T cell and then there are the working T cell, but didn't they play? So there's, there's, um, the, the question was, uh, what is the relationship with, uh, expression in primary, different primary T cells subsets? Am I yes. getting that right? Okay. <laughs> uh, so, uh, they are very closely similar among primary cell subsets, but the difference between expression between primary cells and cell lines like JERCAT are uh, the correlations like 0.7 for Pearson correlation. So it's like not perfect. Okay, so um, I'm going to move from MPRA stuff over to CRISPR stuff now. How are we doing on time? Okay. So um, now that we've employed a method that we think is actually identifying causal variants, we'd really like to know what those variants are doing. And so uh, given that most of these variants, like all the variants that we're studying are outside of genes in enhancer regions, 
uh, we're interested in shutting down those enhancers and seeing how that affects gene expression and cellular function. So we use uh, a DCAS9, so like a catalytically dead Cas9, uh, tethered to a crab domain, uh, which can effectively recruit polycomb and, and suppress gene expression. So in this case, uh, we're just showing that we can use this to shut down, to, to target Cas9 to a specific gene, the transcription start site of a gene, and shut down CD45 uh, expression and also CD83 expression. And uh, it seems to be very effective. So uh, on the x-axis here, we have um, mCherry, which designates DCAS9. And on the y-axis, we have expression of the gene of interest. And uh, this is a non-target, and then this is a target cutter. So uh, given that we could get this working well in primary T cells, we wanted to design a uh, CRISPR library uh, to essentially see whether there's uh, uh, an effect of that specific variant on the function of a T cell. So we, we took our 18,000 variants and we looked for ones that were actually in T cell accessible chromatin. So one thing I haven't told you is that Cas9 preferentially binds inside of accessible chromatin. So uh, if you put CRISPR-I outside of accessible chromatin, it'll likely not do anything. So we're only looking at variants inside of accessible chromatin. And then uh, we looked for guide RNAs that uh, we could actually map inside of those regions. So for around 83% of regions, we could map guide RNAs. And so that allowed us to uh, take 14,000 guide RNAs, around 14 guides per element, and then uh, add 1,000 uh, control guides and 120 positive controls for a total of 15,000 guide RNAs. And then we, we asked, like, well, what kind of T cell functions do we want to assess? So T cells, uh, autoreactive T cells could um, recognize autoantigens. And so uh, that could be part of their uh, ways of contributing to risk. They can uh, cause the T cells to proliferate uh, and migrate and then uh, secrete cytokines in a specific tissue. So there's a bunch of different uh, effector uh, uh, pathways that we could look at. So we, we started with proliferation and cytokine secretion. So um, to do this, we inserted our guide RNA library with CRISPR-I uh, into primary human T cells and allowed and, and took some of those cells right after we infected them just to get a sense for what those cells had. And then we allowed those cells to proliferate for a long time. And then we assessed the difference between the two pools. And um, we have some positive controls that are part of the T cell receptor signaling pathway like that one. And uh, there's a positive control that's um, controlling IL-2, which is really important for that T cell to proliferate. And on the opposite end, we, we, we have CBLB, which is a negative regulator of T cell proliferation. So, uh, and, and in red and blue, we have all the variants, this regulatory regions that affect T cell proliferation. So just for an example, this is a genome track uh, for chromosome eight. And we have these two variants in the cis regulatory region inside of this gene. And uh, using promoter capture hi c again, we can connect these variants to a specific gene in the genome. And this gene actually is known. So these variants seem to be regulating a known regulator of, um, of T cell proliferation. And um, we did a similar screen for interferon gamma, where we sorted on uh, high and low interferon gamma expression, and then we compared the two bins. <clears throat> and we, we found our top hit to be interferon gamma, followed by TBET, which is an, a regulator of, of interferon gamma, and two variants in the promoter of interferon gamma receptor 2, which is required for feed-forward interferon gamma expression. And so there's many variants that actually affect interferon gamma expression as well. Uh, for example, uh, here's a variant inside of uh, an intron of this gene, and we use promoter capture high c to connect it to NF-kappa-B2, which is uh, known to be required for interferon gamma secretion. So we think we found a bunch of uh, uh, variant uh, cis-regulatory regions that actually affect T-cell biology. And uh, just doing some 
pathway analysis, we've found that most of these uh, um, CRISPR I sensitive regions for both of these screens are actually enriched for things that actually do stuff in T cells, uh, perhaps unsurprising. And if we just looked at uh, transcription factors that are known to bind uh, using ChIP-seq uh, inside of those regions, we actually see that there's a large enrichment for RELA, which is a subunit of NFCAP-B, uh, and uh, BRD4, which, which actually is a druggable target. So we could actually uh, play around with some inhibitors and see whether we can uh, sort of regulate the, um, uh, these T cell functions. And, and usually this, this inhibitor has been used in the context of cancer, but not in, in like for a T cell or autoimmune uh, purpose. So um, this is way too busy for you to really look at, but um, taking all of our CRISPR hits with our MPRA data for each variant, we're able to essentially look at the effect on uh, proliferation, interferon gamma secretion, uh, the effects in MPRA, and whether it's a causal variant or, or uh, fine mapped variant according to this uh, PICS method. And we chose around uh, 23 variants to follow up to, be, to better understand how they affect gene expression. Uh, to do that, uh, we used a method that Neville Sanjana developed in his group called StingSeq. Uh, he was also interested in understanding how uh, genetic variants are actually driving gene expression changes and which variant is actually causal. Uh, to do that, he used CRISPR-I uh, to target all the variants and see which gene locally is causing that difference in expression. And so this is a 10x based method where you actually can get um, uh, both uh, gene expression from that cell and the guide RNA. So um, for this particular experiment, our first one totally failed, but the second one worked. And so we used uh, 300 guide RNAs, uh, 227 targeting the 23 variants, and then uh, some positive and negative controls. And uh, this is just a UMAP, but you have to show a UMAP if you're showing single cell data. Uh, this is 40,000 cells across uh, two 10X channels uh, we had cell hashing, guide RNA, and gene expression. And using the scepter analysis that, that Neville Sanjana developed, uh, we found um, 17 significant variant gene interactions from, from these 23 variants. Is there a question? No? Okay. Sounds good. I don't have one, but I'll reserve for that. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, and this is just plotting uh, negative log p-value for that interaction on the y-axis and the log two-fold change on the x-axis. And in the different colors are the distance in log two from that variant to the transcription start site of that gene. So most of the genes that we're finding are actually nearby, but then there are some genes like ELMA1 where, they, where it's a very distal interaction between the variant and the, uh, the gene. Um, and there's a number of interesting targets here that we've, that I'll go more into depth about. So uh, the first is a variant in IL-2RA. So IL-2 is really important for T cell proliferation and function. And so this variant falls within uh, the first intron of IL-2RA. And um, it's very likely to cause disease for both type 1 diabetes and for inflammatory bowel disease. And uh, promoter capture high C indicates that it does contact the IL-2 promoter, but a bunch of other promoters nearby. And so using our uh, single cell CRISPR screens, we're actually able to see that the variant does reduce expression of IL-2RA, but increases expression of many nearby genes like IL-15RA, which is known to be required for memory T cells. So it's not just a simple explanation that this variant drives uh, a reduction in IL-2RA, but it also could affect memory T cell biology. We confirm this using uh, just bulk RNA sequencing and using a single guide experiment, where we see that actually there is a significant increase in IL-15RA, a reduction in IL-2RA, an increase in the nearby genes, other nearby genes. Yes. So. 
whether you, you don't need to go back to it, but you had a plot from a little back to said this is a very busy plot. Um, and you had the GWAS results below it, and any given variant was only associated with one autoimmune disease. Oh, it was just the top disease. Oh, sorry. The question, uh, so going back to this. But uh, here I'm just listing the top disease. So top according to p-value. So I guess my, my question is in terms of being able to use GWAS data across. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is, this is integrating several different studies. But yes. Mm -hmm. Right. You kind of deal with that. Yeah, so the way that we did this was we took the top SNPs for each locus, and then we did LD expansion using 1,000 genomes uh, to ascertain all of the SNPs that are in tight linkage to equilibrium, and then we tested all those in our assays. Yeah, so that's how we come up with it in terms of how we Interpretation. Say, yeah, saying whether or not this particular step is only associated with MS and psoriasis. Yes. It's yeah. So um, we've we've actually recently made more like heat map um, uh, data showing whether that variant has a high effect in multiple diseases. So like then you can have like disease on the y axis and like variant on the x-axis, and then uh, it gives you more of a view instead of just this simplistic plot um, showing only the top disease. But uh, yes, understanding, connecting the variant to disease continues to be a challenge. And so um, I'll go into it a little bit later, but I, for me, it, it's not really nailed down until you have an animal model of it. But, you know, many of these variants are actually not conserved between mouse and human. So um, another option would be to go into patient samples or, or studying how the variant affects, like, human T cells, like, by base editing. Um, but connecting it to diseases continues to be a very hard thing to do. Um, there are many, like, many of these variants have shared haplotypes. And so the light, the causal variant in that that region is likely to cause both diseases in that context. But uh, and you would need to do fine mapping in different in that specific disease context for you to really nail down the causal variants and do these like sort of assays to understand them. So yes, it's it's definitely not. Um, we definitely haven't done the, the most intricate uh, uh, dissection of each disease for this for this study. That's true. Okay. Uh, another example is a variant that's in uh, the second intron of ELMA one, which is actually a a known molecule that's involved with cytos cytoskeletal uh, and actin uh, engagement and actually helping the cell engulf or, or move around. So uh, it's actually really required for lymphocyte migration. And this enhancer seems to be really specific to, to T cells and, and actually some B cells as well. And uh, you can see that targeting this, this uh, region actually has a, a pronounced effect on L1 expression. And the variant itself disrupts in mid one bonds or mid one. So, uh, so I've, I've given you two examples where they're likely causal according to fine mapping, but there are many, many examples where there's actually no likely causal variant according to fine mapping, which I have listed here on the y axis. And so um, here we can take our MPRA data and our, our CRISPR data and see which variants are actually lighting up in the region. So all the variants that are in tight linkage to equilibrium are listed. And then if they're red, big red triangles, they're both MPRA hits and CRISPR hits. So that really indicates that that variant is, is a likely causal variant. Um, but you know, more must be done. And 
uh, we can't actually nail down for sure whether it's the causal variant unless uh, we, we study it in an animal model. One of these particular variants is in a gene called PPP5C. So um, here we have this variant in the promoter of PPP5C, that's the highest GWAS hit. But this, um, this variant is also associated with splicing of PPP5C, so it's much more likely to be actually inside of the gene. And this variant is, um, has a higher effect on T cell proliferation, and it also disrupts ETS and, and um, uh, binding in T cells. So uh, we decided to take a guide RNA and, and target both of these regions and see how that affects uh, uh, global gene expression in T cells. Uh, this gene isn't really actually well known in, in T cells. It's a, it's a phosphatase, but um, uh, another uh, gene that's related to it has been very well studied and actually helps uh, T cells become more effector-like and, and can get rid of or, or can help clear cancer. Um, glioblastomas and, and also help with PD-1 blockade. And so when we target PPP5C either at the variant or at the promoter of those uh, of that of that gene, we actually see that there's very concordant changes in gene expression. And uh, there's really interesting uh, genes that pop up, such as metabolic regulators, uh, effector and exhaustion programs, and migratory programs. So we actually think that, there, that, that this gene that hasn't been previously appreciated in T cells may actually have a, a big effect on T cell biology. And, and we're looking at that more in a mouse model. So uh, just to review everything that I've gone over, uh, we can use MPRA to, to identify likely causal variants. Uh, we can use single cell CRISPR screens to identify how variants affect uh, gene expression. And uh, we can use these bulk screens to better understand uh, the functional effects of, of variants on, on T cell biology. And um, we do have uh, more to do. So we're screening around 30. We did 23 variants initially. We're doing 37 more variants uh, in our single cell screens. And um, we're planning on uh, performing some migration screens because T cell migration to the target tissue is an important biological process. And we're currently testing how PPP5C affects T cell biology in the context of marine uh, inflammatory biases. And with that, I will take any questions. We have the same lab picture as that one sitting. Oh my gosh, here? That, I think it's that restaurant. Yeah. Yes, I, on Capitol I, Hill. I don't know if you take back with this. Yes, I don't know if you take back with this. It's like the Oaxaca. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Do <laughs> <laughs> like, they know where are you using? <laughs> Got the, the variation between the mature cat data and the primary data. So the Cells, but you also have genetic variation to make those lines. True. Talk a little bit about how this to like pick out modifier genes or other variant dependent effects of these G glass bits. Or does that just get like outside the scope of the resolution you're asking? Yeah. Um, so Okay, so the question is on GERCAT versus primary T cells and how you can use that data to sort of understand better the, the genes that could modify or potentially like put at risk like people. Uh, I, I actually view the GERCAT data as like useful in its own right and the primary T cell data is useful because really when, it break, when you break it down, they're both enriching for causal variants. And one could be doing it in the context, in a totally different context than the other, but that's just more information about like which TFs are driving disease in that specific context. Um, so I don't know that this is necessarily getting at your question, but I think uh, applying MPRA to many different contexts, to many different subsets of T cells, many and B cells, and you know, all over the place. 
would only give us more information about variants that actually affect gene expression and the mechanisms by which that happens. Uh, so you'd be able to understand which transcriptional regulators are really playing a role in that cell type and also like which variants seem to be susceptible to that. So with the existence of these variants, what could have triggered the onset of the Yeah, autoimmune? great question. Yeah, so um, I didn't talk about it before, but GWAS only discovers a portion of heritability for disease, and obviously environment plays a really large role. Like EBV is being recognized as a huge driver of multiple sclerosis, for instance. Um, and so we, we believe that viral infections are, are really important for, for driving these diseases. And so like what we're studying is really only a snippet of how variants could affect like T cell biology, but variants could very well affect, you know, epithelial cells or like the pancreatic islets to be like presenting specific antigens to T cells. Um, so I think that there's environmental cues that play a role. And I think that many other cell types also have their own genetic variation that that drives disease. And collectively, that's what that's what essentially uh, gets you to disease. Right, <laughs> exactly. Is there, Lisa, did you have a question online? Uh, yes, I do. Um, I was just, this is a naive question, but I was thinking about um, whether or not I mean, you, these days we can differentiate iPS cells into just about anything. Is, yep. Can you differentiate them into T cells? And yes. And and I just wonder if that would be a way to get at some um, complexities related to patient um, back, you know, genetic background that might influence some of these um, enhancers and how they work. Yeah, I love that question. Um, so I think. This is a really good way. So like T cells, we can edit them, but if we edit iPSCs, we can actually see all of the lineages prior to when a T cell becomes a T cell and how those are affected as well. Right. Uh, you can also maybe get iPSCs. I'm not sure if anyone's done this, but iPSCs from patients versus controls and then see how those are sort of acting differently um, and edit them effectively. So. Uh, I think iPSCs are a great tool. We haven't gone down that road, uh -huh. uh, but people at the Institute are starting to use them. So, so we may, uh, we may start dabbling in that. Because especially when you think about transcription factors, if there are other transcription factors in the genome that are um, differentially expressed in those individuals, that can also impact how the transcription factors bind and so forth. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we're so. also doing, M we're going to start be, uh, doing MPRAs in actual patient samples. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. So I think that like, we'll be able to do these motif analyses, you know, to understand the TFs that are actually driving uh, variant effects in that context. Then. Sounds great. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Great. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Again, thank you. Thanks everybody for joining and please join us on April 24th for Next Science Matters with Dr. Moultrie from CSD. Thanks very much. All right.